Visuals get to your brain 10,000 times faster than words. So they already in your brain, but you just don't realize it. So you think, oh my God, I must be thinner. They're very clever visuals because they get to your brain fast. That's why advertisers love them. You need to be aware of the intention. It's a billion dollar industry to make you feel crap. And actually this is the most clever thing because it's the most unattainable thing to be thin at all times. So the more something is unattainable, the more profitable it will be. The generation of our kids need to look at even more visuals. Training them that how to look at images, how visuals are affecting them, and therefore to put distance with them. That is not truthful at all times, especially in the rise of deepfakes, for instance. It's not at all times something that they should digest. Do you think AI is destroying creatives and creativity? Quick question. When did you discover that you're a leader? that your actions matter to those that look up to you. You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Maureen, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. I've been reading about your business, Empty Art, and I'm so fascinated and really impressed with what you have achieved with the business. But oh, thank you. before we get into it, for those people who may know who you are, can yep. you introduce yourself? It's always hard, isn't it, to do an introduction in a very short time. I'm the lucky CEO and founder of Empty Art Agency. So we are the art sector's leading talent agency. What that means in short is you build the reputation of the artists that you love, make sure that they get to the top, but also you integrate the art across all different types of contexts, from public art to brand partnership to digital to fine art institution. Um, and it's a pure joy to see you know, millions of people that will get exposed to the arts from walking up to Regent Street. We kicked up the World Cup with uh, public art. We have the National Portrait Gallery that's got the works of our artists, etc. So it's the sheer joy of seeing people who are talented to succeed. And the second one is to have people who are inspired by the art on a constant basis. Um, I think it probably captures who I am as a person where I love to support talent. I get really excited to see ambitious, driven people succeed. Um, and I, I have a lot of admiration for resilience as well and, and someone who's, you know, has that inspiration and that vision. And secondly, I just, I enjoy the, the act of creating magic where you're, someone is looking at something that's, you know, artistically uh, touching or emotional or conceptual or like, and just stopping for a few seconds and engaging with this. And, uh, and so I think as a person, that's probably the two things I care most about. Mm. So where did the passion for art come from for you? Um, so I actually grew up in a place where there's no art whatsoever, um, but there mm. is, it's very visually beautiful. So I'm sure that informed the need at least to have a visual environment that is inspiring. It's um, called Ile de Ray, which is a French island on the west coast of France. Um, and I spent 17 years there. there is, I always joke that there's more birds than people there, so there's not much <laughs> happening on a, on a regular basis. And, um, and yeah, it's just, you know, you're going off to school, then um, there's a bus to go to the mainland for high school because you don't have a high school after one site. But you're surrounded by the sea, um, the fields. I love cycling there. So you are, I guess, immersed into an environment where visually you'll be very inspired by it. Um, so I think that probably developed a sensitivity towards the need of having a visual environment that... Um, I felt really inspired. I'm incredibly sensitive to visual envi environments and the wish to kind of design them, shape them, influence them, inspire the people with visual environments. And um, I think 
artists came from books that I read. I'm a big reader. Um, I read a book a week, so and I've always read loads. It was um, my parents always had to tell me off from not reading too late at night. Um, so, which I know, I know sounds weird that they would tell me off, but actually they were finding that annoying that I was staying up late so long. But I feel from books, it was always the characters. I just love the strong, inspiring characters, which I find a lot in the artists at work today, where they are people who have defied the odds, who've gone through an incredible life, who have a very powerful story to tell. And I think that comes probably from that joy of just reading books where you feel that character is just so deeply inspiring. So mm. that's the relationship I developed with characters and therefore artists early on. And I think the visual environment is just a luck of being born in, in, in a place where it's very visually beautiful. Mm. You know, when you're talking about your parents telling you off for reading like I mean my mom was like that I mean I read but and I probably used to read a lot more back when I was younger than now but uh, my sister's like just completely obsessed and when she she even will like have a book while she's eating her dinner or lunch and it's like literally just like surgically attached to a book I quote books regularly all day mm. long and I'm always seen like I have one in my basket on my way to kind of come and see you I just they are shaping my brain. I think it's just, it's, it's just, they teach you to think differently about ideas. You have to immerse yourself into worlds that are not yours. And ultimately, I think my empathy, my levels of understanding the world, but also my relationship with myself is constantly developing as a result of reading. Mm -hmm. um, I'm now lucky that um, a lot of the people that I love around me actually also publish books. So it's also quite interesting to kind of be able to read the books and then discuss with the author. And I think that's such a luxury of mm -hmm. trying to comprehend how those books are made in the first place. But they are a very important part of my life um, mm -hmm. and, I, and they occupy a lot of my conversations daily. Mm. No, I totally get that about talking to the authors who have written books because on the show, that's one of my favorite things as well. It's like, you know, reading something most of the time is management or business yeah. and then talking to the author about it and just like really getting under the skin and understanding where the concepts and the ideas come from because I mean, when you're reading a book you're spending quite a significant period of time with that person totally. uh, getting into their way of thinking and you know listening to their arguments I mean depending on what the book is about yeah. whether it's a novel or a, you know a, some sort of a, an argument about how to improve your life and whatnot so you know growing up in a very beautiful in environment spending a lot of time reading books when did the idea to found Empty Art come from? I was always very romantic. I think something, again, probably coming from a good visual environment, or at least good, at least something that a visual environment I found inspiring myself. I just felt um, I, I had capacity to visualize things. And I think visualize ultimately the life I wanted and the things I would want to do. Um, as a romantic, I feel I wanted that life surrounded by creatives. Um, I wanted a a workplace that was like this and I wanted uh, projects or at least some form of job that was to do with them. I couldn't shape it any better because obviously it didn't exist on the island. But I did write exactly that vision at 19 when applying to an internship at BBC. I wrote that I wanted the arts to kind of collaborate better with each other and ultimately to impact audiences at a larger scale. Because um, it was very much that kind of visual environment immersion that I was looking for and I wanted to was design um, and I got accepted and I thought that was incredible people were paid to do something so interesting um, I could literally do it eyes closed including weekends without thinking because I thought well but Andrew Graham Dixon does for the culture show it was so interesting he just reads books talks about them and you know meets creatives I was like if jobs like this exist, then I have to find myself how to get one of those jobs because that sounds like I would never work a day in my life again. Um, and I was approached by um, someone who discovered Banksy called Steve Lazaridis, who built a very successful business called Lazaridis and discovered many street artists. Um, because I was chatting to everyone. I was finding it really interesting. I think we had that conversation before the podcast on your love for asking questions, but I generally was very curious about the way the sector was put together. I was offered quite a few opportunities very young, thanks to that. Um, and then the one that stuck was being the Gary manager for Steve Lazaridis. Um, manager is Gary in Soho. Street artists were completely remote to what I would know normally, because again, I was more on the poetry 
romantic side. I think they opened up a world for me of how do you create social and political impacts ultimately through putting art on the streets. And I feel that opened up my brain again on thinking, I really like that. I like the fact that ultimately people are thinking differently thanks to the art that they encounter on the streets. Um, and I was lucky again to have an investor walking into my gallery two years from that. So I'm now 23 and saying, I would like to open a gallery with someone in Los Angeles. I was in London at the time and he would want to invest in that person building the business up. I said, yes. Um, and, and yeah, went to Los Angeles, built the gallery and through building the galleries, discovered all the top talent agencies in Los Angeles. And I feel the relationship that a talent agency has with its talents, which is ultimately backing them, constructing the entire business to run them more than a gallery that for me feels more like a retail store and a space. So the relationship is more with the space and the objects than with the talent. Um, just inspired me. And I felt that the art world doesn't have a talent agency. Um, all the talent agencies I see in music, film and sports are super inspiring. Um, I would like to build that business. Um, and so at 25, I went back, started building it, um, put all the values I thought were most dear to me, all the problems I couldn't solve in the sector, such as making sure that there was more revenues for artists earlier, making sure that audiences at large could be reached because we're in a sector where we didn't really do that. So I lined up my kind of dream plan on what that vision will be. Um, and I think being 25 does allow you to be very idealistic about things. But what, one thing I'm very, very grateful for is actually that vision happened, but also we never diverted from that vision and those values. And those values are um created by a very idealistic 25 years old and i'm so glad that they were not created by a cynical um older adult who would have probably thought that's not possible let's not put that in or um those values sounds like you know too idealistic so th i'm super pleased that this is not hasn't been the case i'm very grateful for 25 years old and i have a really good relationship with that 25 years old for that reason mm. I'm glad I'm now elder adults who can execute things. <laughs> I think the dynamic works both ways. But yeah, we're lucky it worked out. Mm. We're now, it feels crazy to be the number one. It felt crazy to be one of the fastest growing company in the country, according to the Times. Um, it, lots has happened, but I feel the passion is still there and exactly the same. The values are still the same. And I think it's amazing that the team onboarded onto those values. I feel it's, um, you know, I am... Um, it was my birthday last week, not to say happy birthday, but more to say, <laughs> I said to my team, I don't want anything material, but I would want to understand um, the relationship you have with the company. That would be the best birthday present for me. Um, and I think it's just like, it's just, you know, they came up with words of reflection that I could not come up myself. And I think that is amazing to see that the vision is evolving in the hands of a team of partners, of clients, of talents, who care a lot about it um, and going beyond you, which I think is really, I'm really grateful for. Mm. I'll come back to that, the going beyond you, but I'd like to go back in time again to, you know, you being 25 yeah. and the mindset that you had. Tell me how you were feeling at that time, because sometimes when you're starting a business, it comes from either a necessity or you're like, oh, this hasn't been done or, oh, it's really scary, but you know what, I'm just going to do it anyway. So what were you feeling at that time? I, think I had all the feels of a 25 years old where ultimately, I mean, I, I can't generalize, but you know, you're very intense about everything and everything that happens is felt intensely. Um, everything is overly dramatized because it's just the nature of the age. But again, I wouldn't have it any other way. And so, uh, you know, for me, it was a matter of this is it. I'm either building that or not doing anything. It was very dramatic in a very black and white radical way that you can be in that age. But that radicality meant that I didn't want to take another job. I preferred to struggle and financially and build the business I wanted and do all these things that I think the lack of radicality will probably have made it very different. So, but it was very black and white. It was, I want this and mm -hmm. I want that to happen and I, I want to build it and and there's no other option and I don't want to hear about plan B or plan C or plan D, right? So it's a, it's a radicality of being in your 20s, uh, which I love. I've always said I have loved every single of my age um, and I hope it continues because I just, you see how different you are with every phase of life, you know, and that phase was radical. Um, I wanted to change things. I was not afraid to say it. I was not afraid to say most of my views. Um, and... And I was just probably not thinking much of the consequences because you're just so passionate about 
what you want to build. And I think that enables you to build something that's bolder than, you know, I mean, an age where you think consequences much more for obvious reasons that it impacts your team and what you've built a lot more. So you're not able to take as much risk. You take risk because I want to keep risk taking at the heart of the business, but you will definitely not take radical risk in the same way once you are managing people because the responsibilities have shifted. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's, it's a beautiful age for this. I feel, I feel twenties are very beautiful for that, but they are tough. Like they are intense years. They're not like, it's not like you lie there being like, I'm so happy to be in that phase, but lived intensely. I think they are wonderful. They're a wonderful decade of just the experiment, the, black and white ideas, the need for change, the wish for change, and the, the how idealistic you are about it, that I think has a true value to society and a true value when building a business mm -hmm. as well. I mean, what you're saying is actually there's a lot of confidence there. And I'm not sure every 25-year-old is the same. So yeah, of course, yeah, yeah totally. Everyone where where do you me. think your confidence comes from? I do think it's a confidence in the sense that I don't look at myself in the mirror. I was laughing this weekend because my four years old looked at himself in the mirror and clearly adored what he was seeing, which was the cutest thing to watch. But I definitely wouldn't have that look at myself in the mirror for thinking I'm wonderful. It's more, I am able to act even when the situation is complex or when there's doubts or when there's anxiety, when there's those a feeling. Um, there's a, I'm a very action driven person. Um, I think I have chased a bit philosophically, but one of the philosophy in my twenties was more a Sartre, where it's existentialist. You know, every action defines you. I think, I think I'm more of an in between at this stage. Um, I will be more on the Buddhism, where you're just much more emotions mixed with actions, and you grow a bit more because I think your vulnerability and your empathy is growing with age as well. But I think at that time it's very action driven. So it doesn't mean you're confident. It means you are just. Um, you just do one action after another and you have the capacity to action things. Um, and I think that's more what my strength is. I can act even when things are difficult. Um, even when it's a bit scary to act, I will still be able to act. Um, and I think that's a strength, I think, in the context mm -hmm. of being an entrepreneur. So what has given you this confidence to be able to act even when things are difficult? Um, well, I feel like, you know, I have... I, I, you never wake up with confidence. It's a muscle. I believe that everything is a muscle, whether it's like your social skills, imagination, your visual sense, uh, your resilience, all of the things are muscles that you're built up over time. So I do believe you ever wake up being like, Tana, I'm, I'm like resilient now. But I do feel it gets better. And obviously the more risk you take, the more comfortable you are with being uncomfortable and all those things just unfold to be now 15 years later when I'm very comfortable being uncomfortable in a situation and not knowing about something and acquiring knowledge for this. But I feel therefore that it's been now since 17 that I ultimately I look after myself financially and um, and life-wise, um, knowing about the way my parents are both primary teachers, but they just not able to kind of uh, contribute to the financial needs of universities or what, you're, what I'm now doing business-wise. Mm -hmm. So I think with financial independence so early on, you do have a sense, I think probably of that where you mentioned confidence where, you know, every action, you pick up the consequences of it and you comprehend ultimately what the actions are going to do. Mm -hmm. But also you just shape, your shape, I've been shaping my life for a very long time um, as a person and since very young. So I feel like it's, um, you get better at it year mm -hmm. on year like and you take better at understanding what's right for you what's not it doesn't mean tons of people haven't helped me but it just means you know it's been since 17 that ultimately uh, the bills are paid by me and my comp my understanding of that is by me so therefore um i comprehend how to go about things and how difficult things will be or not and i think the economical empowerment pro probably plays a part in that mm -hmm. so are you saying that financial independence was a drive for you I do think, no, I do think it was a drive, but I think having to earn money probably changes um, how you would go about life for sure, because ultimately you can't make the same decisions, but it also means that like the way you would act will be different. So I, for me, financial has never been a drive, but they are an understanding that there's no option. Mm -hmm. Like, so by understanding that it's there and you're having to, you know, respond to it mm -hmm. probably makes you a very different person that if, if there was a net or a safety net right um but no i feel like it for me like also having looked after myself since a young age i don't find financial scary 
I don't think like because you just you get used to it. You get used to being the person that provides. So you also don't um think this is something kind of unattainable as a goal that you must attain. It's for something that's part of life that you know you have to ultimately look after. Mm. Talking about finances, I mean I'll share my own personal story about I used to paint all the time and you know my parents were like oh she's really good at that let's sort of support that her and push her into it and ultimately I decided not to pursue it because it seemed like a very unsure path because you know you kind of see artists who are either struggling or very few really make it to you know the top echelons and so picking a path that was a little bit more sure a little bit more proven or at least you know you you know whatever you put in whatever you get out so this financial aspect that puts i'm sure a lot of people off pursuing art as yeah. a career and i love what you're doing with empty art of democratizing that and also supporting artists can you talk more about that what you're doing with yeah. your business so we contribute to your cost of our artists monthly um and we make sure that they have reported as much earlier so i think from so while finance are not the drive i feel ideas and people being able to realize the ideas is the drive now finance will be a component of it because i believe that knowing the right people and having the right contacts will also be another component and the many inequalities that you could have in the matter of it so finance being one component of it um for us it was important to be able to provide it um, I'm very passionate about having diversity of talents. So ultimately, who gets to inspire you artistically for me must be diverse. Um, and and for that to happen, you need, like you say, to uh, make sure that all social economics align for everyone to be able to produce art because otherwise you just only get to be inspired by a type of people. And that's my big problem with the sector. There's a great book that you would like called Culture is Bad for You. Mm -hmm. And it sadly lays out all the inequalities. I think it's probably the first book you read thinking, shit, there's a lot of problems. Um, I would like to think I'm like the solution person. So I would hope to be refreshing after the book. But that you know like i will give a few examples from our artists but raven d clark who comes from a working class background just got a two million deal um six months ago for three public art sculptures in alabama in the us um the sculptures will be on slavery so it's also shaping historically that will be permanent a topic that's essential plus at the, her, her age she's able to take a mortgage um and if you think that 97 percent of um sculptures you see on the streets are by white men i think that's like incredible like her not only is her empowerment happening artistically but also financially so i love that i love that kind of examples i like to strive for deals like this because a raven will be able to inspire many in the making um and there will be girls i cannot inspire because i cannot be their role model but she'll be their role model and that's the importance of having a diversity of role models per se um so I think we always believe in the value of opportunities. We've never accepted opportunities that didn't pay artists. We just believe in the way to be fairly paid. And it's hard that you get into argument for that um, because people will be like, it's great exposure for the artists and all of this reasoning to why this should be done. Um, so it's ironic as an entrepreneur, you know, I will be doing interviews or loads of things non-paid happily because I would understand this is marketing for the company. But actually for our artists, we'll make sure, always make sure that there's a fairly paid opportunity behind it. Um, and that runs deep in the values of the company. Um, and again, it's, it's to make sure that finance actually is not a problem because if finance, if finance is better equalized and you don't think about it anymore, you just, you just see talent. But if, obviously if you don't uh, attend to it or, um, you know, make sure that you look after the financial disparities and you actually finance becomes a problem. So specifically because I don't want to speak about finance, I want to speak about their talent, that I wanted to address the financial issues and, and inequalities that the sector was facing. So it's a joy to get there. It's, it's so many of those examples are just so fulfilling on a daily basis. Um, and, and yeah, but it's a joy to kind of sign those deals for that reason. Mm. How do you select your artists? So we have a selection committee. Um, and we get about 200 applications a month. So we get a lot wow. of applications. I'm sure it's now more, but because we haven't measured it, I don't want to tell a, mm -hmm. a number that's wrong, but it's actually, I've been saying the same number for it right now, and I'm pretty sure it's more. But um, but yeah, we look at people who have this very unique voice from 
the style and how it's adding value to the medium that they're using or the medium's plural up to conceptually how they position um like what story do they tell that adds value ultimately to the artistic uh, context we in so to give you an example like one of our artists that i empower is using ai in her work and music as well and she's looking at the way in which we connect to landscape and she's making this very imaginative but imaginative, beautiful landscape that you almost can't touch or relate to, to kind of show our, our relationship with a lot of the images that we take, especially on social media, just not connecting to the landscape we are, just seeing them as a background, almost like a, a Windows countryside background, where it's just a background to put your fires on, but you're not actually connecting with it. So you, each of them will have almost a topic or way to look at the world that's very unique and they would have dive into um, and it's a joy again because you just are lucky in that job to be constantly learning about ways to look at the world. We live in a world now full of technology and access to visuals every second of the day. I mean, I yeah. don't know what the latest statistics are about just how much we are exposed to on a day to day basis. Yeah. And imagery is everything. So we're going from, you know, you know, you growing up in in France and seeing beautiful landscapes to sitting in front of a screen and, you know, Instagram and social media bombarding us with with images. And I've watched your uh, one of your TED talks about this idea of, you know, you have to be careful about what you feed your eyes yeah. and how much that influences us. And that really stuck with me because it's true what we choose to consume impacts us. So I guess the question is what what kind of imagery is good for our health and what kind of imagery is not? So I feel this is a complex question. Um, did you read the book Process People that just came out of Penguin? So there's a there's a book that came out about sadly the processed food impact that we are digesting. It's, it's quite a scary book to read if it, and it's um, it sparked a lot of conversation for the past few weeks because the snacking industry is worth 700 billions and it's actually on a five percent increase year on year and i feel for me visual junk is kind of a similar i'm about to publish a book on the exact topic of the ted talk so actually the ted talk inspired penguin to approach me to publish a book and that's coming up on the 7th of march but the we've gone slightly away from food the reason why is because Exactly like you said, we don't want to fall into the good and bad. What I want to fall onto is your awareness that you're consuming loads of visuals because you know you're consuming food because you're going to the loo after or you're just getting energy and you're, you are aware of your digestive system, what I would hope you are, right? But actually you're not aware as much that you're consuming visuals. So for me, it's more about the awareness that you're interacting with those visuals and those visuals affect you more than trying to classify good and bad. Now, there is... A caveat to add to this in the light of the process people book is that I do think there are visuals in repetition that will make you feel very insecure, more to consume probably something that's not very great for you and probably shape you in a way that's not ideal, right? My problem with good and bad is that I don't want someone to feel shit and to start for having guilt because ultimately that's also what's happening with food. Our thing is how do we make sure that you have awareness for food, but you don't feel guilty every two seconds. And that's a lot of what that book is about, because I don't want some people to start thinking, crap, I was feeling guilty with food, and now Marines may feel guilty with visuals. That is not at all the feeling I want to give you. The feeling I want to give you is, actually, did you realize that in just a single day, you look at a thousand visuals? Do you even realize that? And actually, you are in discussion with them in the same way that if suddenly someone on the street was coming up to you and shouting at you, you'll think, oh gosh, I have to tell that story. Someone just randomly walked to me and shouted at me. But actually visuals do this all the time. You have those visuals that aggress you and would, you know, would impact your brain emotionally. They will trigger you, but you're not aware of that. You probably just bypass it without thinking that was a trigger. Whereas actually when it's a word and someone shout that word at you, you are aware of that trigger. So for me, the key thing is awareness. Second key thing is that through that awareness that you curate your diet. Once again, it's the same with food for me. If you want to eat tons of junk food, I am not here for you to tell you you shouldn't. But I think you should be aware. It's all about information, that game of making sure you are knowledgeable mm. about what you're ultimately looking at and consuming. I think in visual, it's the same. You know, if for me, it's not just social media that would make you feel insecure it's and everyone always puts a conversation on social media but actually no it's advertising on the billboards it's magazines it's social media i mean 
magazines have been making us feel crap as women for mm-hmm. like you know decades they haven't waited for social media and that bikini picture of that woman to make us feel crap and i think it's a bit too easy to say we're addicted to technology of course there's separate issues of technology but actually there's a visual content we're constantly being bombarded with for so many decades that comes out of the advertising sector the political sector that is feeding us mm-hmm. now again it's for us to be thinking hold on I feel crap about my body or I feel crap about wanting to be someone or consume something because maybe I've seen hundreds of visuals for the past three days that reinforces. And that enables you to put distance with that thought because otherwise, you know, the visuals get to your brain 10,000 times faster than words. So they already in your brain, but you just don't realize it. So you think, oh my God, I must be thinner. But actually, how helpful would it be that you think, hold on, I'm being told to be thinner more than I must be thinner. And that's, again, the, they're very clever visuals because they get to your brain fast. You don't comprehend they got to your brain. You have very little awareness. You've actually consumed all that content. And then you go and act. And, of course, that's why advertisers love them because they, got, they get to you really quickly. But you're not even aware that this is through them that actually you're starting feeding off those desires, those wishes, and those insecurities. So the key thing is really awareness, um, mm. more than good and bad. And after this, it is up to you um, to make decisions. But I want you to be knowledgeable and aware. Mm. We are being bombarded with visuals. Someone's creating these on purpose. Yeah. So it's also the intention behind it. Like what triggers are they trying to elicit in you? And that kind of goes much deeper than just, you know, like, well, I've sort of, this picture of this girl in a bikini and now I feel, you know, an hour later, you know, I'm, I don't know, snacking on (laughs) Doritos because it made me feel bad that I will never be that way or whatever. Um, But it's the intention behind these images that also is, is, is a danger. What, what must we do to avoid it? I think intention, you cannot avoid it purely because we are in a belief society. So all of us have a belief system. Um, if you think the people who use most images to start with were religion, right? The Christian church in the 15th century started telling stories of how you should behave, how Marie is behaving, how Jesus Christ is behaving through visuals, right? Um, so I think being in a society of belief, you would always have people who have different belief and that's fine. Like there's nothing you can do about this. This is, we are made to judge and believe constantly because that's our way to survive. We adapt to the world's true belief system. What you said is true on, we need to be aware of the intention. So when you are reading a paper that is right wing and it's talking about immigration, you know that their views on immigration is going to be X way. And that's fine because, again, if you're right wing, you can embrace that. But if you're not, then at least you know the viewpoint on that problem is a way, right? If you're watching Fox News versus BBC News, you know your viewpoint are going to change. The problem is we haven't been taught to do the same with visuals. And going back to intention, there's nothing wrong with having intentions. We will, as as belief um people we would always try to push belief system onto other people we mm-hmm. think our belief our way to approach life is obviously the best right and you see it i'm sure with motherhood non-stop where everyone thinks that the best parents ever right and this is a way to do things so that you can't change but you can change that you can't put in the intention of what's being what's being pushed as a visual so if um you know the let's go back to the big picture you can you can for instance relate to the fact that it's a billion dollar industry to make you feel crap and actually this is the most clever thing because it's the most unattainable thing to be thin at all times because it's almost impossible through changes of the body through the aging through pregnancies so this means that you can constantly produce, like consume products because it's unattainable so the more something is unattainable the more profitable it will be and i think of course that image is feeding like you know so much of a large industry up to fashion to gym classes to amazon sending you mats and and ways to kind of restrict the the uh, the belly and all the, all those things are being fed out of images like this. Once you know this, again, you can take part in it. I enjoy being sportive and I enjoy feeling confident in my body. You can take a decision on how you want to be, but just be aware of why images are being put out there. Mm. But the, you can't stop belief system. We are born to believe and we shape belief system nonstop as people. So how are we as a, a regular person that is bombarded with so many images, what can we do to shield ourselves from this? I think it's less shielding is more putting distance with it. 
It's the same, you know, in mental health where the, a lot of the discussions are, you've said something tough to me, or I need to just be able to process that, not react straight away and comprehend my best way to react with it. For me, like the fact that the world will send you signals that will trigger you is something you could never avoid it because otherwise we'll have to be on our sofas all day long and never leave house, the house, right? But I feel the way you respond to them is a key thing. If someone's is, again, comes up to you and says something rude, it's your way to respond that matters. It's, it's not, um, you can't control that someone at some point is going to say something rude to you, but you can control how you're affected by it, how it's going to guide your day, how you're going to process it, how you're going to look after yourself and be kind to yourself to respond to it. I think visuals for me is the same, where they will be there. Actually, the generation of our kids is going to look at even more visuals, but training them that how to look at images, how visuals are affecting them, and therefore to put distance with them. That is not truthful at all times. It's not, uh, especially in the rise of deepfake, for instance, it's not at all times something that they should digest, that they can, they're allowed to put distance in the same way that the emotions of other people, they're allowed to put distance with them. It's in that distance that you'll be able to be healthy with it because you want to evolve in your world and you want to be filled with experiences. I do visuals. I want to be filled with experiences of different visuals. But I think it's treating them as what they are, which is a visual that is not yours. And I think to put distance, to ultimately create your own visual environment separately, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that distance is the same where if someone shouts at you, it's more to do with them, it's to do with you. So the distance is again, very important to comprehend that while it's affecting you, it's not everything. Mm -hmm. And I think right now we're consuming them, they become everything because we're not putting the right distance with them. But with the right distance, it's totally fine to have visuals surrounding us. I think it's just that it's teaching that distance. Talking about teaching, how are you teaching your children to interact with images? Um, that's really interesting. I feel so. I feel my kids are very privileged, and I think it's important to say that as, as you start with that conversation, because you know, like um, Atlas, my eldest, I have a almost four years old and a four months old. But Atlas, my eldest, is exposed to people who make visuals all the time. So he's not just seeing a visual; he's then encountering a creative, a team of creative or an artist. I will tell them tell him how he's made that or how or she has made that visual. That changes everything because I think the critical thinking of it, he's going to constantly be thinking that person made it or that team made it. So th there's a comp th there's an understanding that again is not the truth and the, it's actually, I'm sorry, it's multiple creativity that comes together in making that visual. So I feel that exposure is incredible. I think again, through their privileges, um, they're encountering different visual narratives and storytelling all day long because they, they, they're being shifted from different visual environments all the time. Like I'm going with one of my artists next week in Sicily with my eldest and his eldest. So they're constantly like in studios in different visual environments in the city. My job is incredible for this because when we implement the public art projects and when we go to the studio of the artists, when we do brand collaborations, it's in such different environments all the time in such different countries that they their breadth of understanding of the visual diversity that you can have is quite large. Um, so, I don't, and, you know, I think it's hard to tell how it would affect them because they're still in the making at this stage. Um, but it just, you know, I loved it when we did the David Attenborough documentary on Apple TV. So we did all his public art that was released a month and a half ago. And that morning it was everywhere on the press. And there was specifically that public art image of a big dinosaur because it's not a dinosaur, it's called planets. Um, and it's all biodegradable painting. It's on 40 meters, what our artist did, uh, David Popper for it. And it was on the Metro paper and I just ripped off the image and Atlas went off to school with it. Um, and the teacher sent me the funniest picture two hours from that where he was standing. You will swear he had led the whole project. He had so much confidence next to that picture and was explaining to the other kids how this was made and then that evening the artist dropped by at the house um with my two colleagues and you know atlas interacted with him on he thought actually they were quite small because which is an interesting comment because for him the dinosaurs look really small in that image when they're obviously 40 meters long but that's actually a really good awareness of scale mm -hmm. and the fact that there's a, you know, there's a very big difference on, on the way you look at an image versus, with its scale, right? But I feel therefore he's so lucky because he's able to hold that little image 
to make sense of it, to explain it and to ask questions further into it with people who have answers, not all the answers, but some answers. So I just, I'm curious to see how he's going to approach the world through that. But therefore the hope is that he has that critical thinking um, and that he's able to better and better ask questions about it. It's so interesting because it's as growing up and just seeing the behind the scenes of it, like my family were all musicians. So it's the understanding of what goes on like behind the stage, the training that requires to produce something that, you know, just looks so elegant and so simple. And the same with images where you see something, you know, even scrolling through Instagram and you see it for like a split second, but actually how much work has gone into it. And, you know, what are the values of the artist who conceptualized it? And then, you know, if it's a a sculpture or you know something very intricate that requires not just one individual to put that together there's whole teams behind it and just understanding it from a completely different perspective rather than just like the final like yeah. the result and that's still just all you see um which i hope people will be able to see more and more because i mean we have to again with deep fake and ai going to who created the image is going to be really important we have to really put in place a check-in process on how an image is made because it, it obviously tells a very different story whether it's real or whether it's fake it also tells a very different story on where it's displayed and I think it's it's going to be really essential that we ask those questions um, but I think going back to my kids yes I think they're so lucky because they are in that reflection anyway and their dad is in tech um, he was one of the youngest VC in Europe in the B2B tech sector and for his own VC and I feel He's there, therefore, he will be much more scientific and technologically led, therefore. So I feel something I've always loved about our kids is the fact that the questioning that we would have towards life is going to be almost completely opposite, but therefore very complementary. Mm -hmm. We definitely don't ask the same questions um, as a couple, as a relationship uh, towards the world. And I think that's, I hope, would enable them to just have different questions in stock when they encounter a situation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back on the deep fake and AI, because yes. I think that's a really interesting conversation. But just going back to your kids and obviously them seeing the behind the scenes of, of, of art and what's going on and you being so, you know, passionate and, you know, deeply involved in the space. I'm just curious what your parenting approach is when it comes to encouraging your kids to do or make art. I think the, I think for me, like being a parent was essential and very important. So I think your, so I've been with Will for, for nine years now and for being parent first was like always going to be the plan. It's something that we thought deeply about it. Um, so therefore my parenting approach is like a 15 years old reflection. It's like something that I've always wanted, but I therefore wanted to make sure that this was enabling another human being to be really empowered in terms of the, the life that they would take on. I think it became as the two businesses, the businesses of my husband and I started doing really well. It was also how do we empower them to be them, uh, you know, show it away from ultimately what their parents are doing. And I feel the, and she did probably the wrong word, I think it's more for them to find really what they care about beyond what we both love. So I think empowerment for me is really important. Um, first of all, I feel there's a great book by one of my girlfriends, Mary Gentles, who did Gentle Empowerment, Gentle Guidance. It's called Gentle Guidance, but it's about empowerment of kids. And she got an OB for the way she was empowering kids um, as a teacher, as a head teacher, and then went on to publish the book. And I think the value she described is very much values I have. So for me, it was always about how do I get those kids to be confident and take on the world and have that muscle of resilience, muscle of imagination, muscle of interacting with people and asking the right questions. And I think absolutely the world is theirs because they come from foundations of a family that love each other, that's very stable, um, and that is able to provide there for the different opportunities on whoever they be decide to become. So I think for me, their kindness, their empathy, their imagination, their resilience, their confidence was going to be the key component of what I had to pass on because the rest I felt confident I could provide. Um, so I think art was not really, 
I think it's art is not really like a, a key pillar in a sense. I think visual is like making sure that he's visually curious in the same way that he's, you know, music wise, he also has that curiosity that he has a curiosity towards math and books and developing all types of curiosities that are the heart of it. I think, you know, in a sense, like he's, I never took Matt Lee for both. So like he, they are so exposed to what I do that I'm really not that stressed about them not being familiar with the art world. Um, but I care a lot less about that. I'm more thinking, I just hope this gives them the curiosity of finding out what they love. And now if it is art, then fantastic. If it is an art, I couldn't care less as a person. I think the joy we both get as a couple is to do what we love on a daily basis. So my priority is for them to find that is not to find some kind of truth in the art world is to, to find as Atlas of Ivaldi, what do they want to become? Mm-hmm. Um, and I will be so excited to discover that with them. So even the, the education system we went for, um, in Brisbane, Johnny Manuel is bilingual and very creatively led so that enables them hopefully to be less about achievements and more about what they love to learn and then ultimately find that so i think all our principles is more around this um now of course they're exposed you know my like i frame his little drawings uh, next to the artworks we've created over the past 10 years and i do it on purpose i don't frame all the drawings but i go through curation with him and he's very proud like he's drawing some next to the artworks nicely framed and uh, nicely hang and I, I want his confidence to feel his visual expression is taken into an account into a house that's literally filled by art. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's again more confidence discussion than it is an artistic discussion. I would never want him to feel he can't express himself. I mean, so far, it really doesn't seem that this could be the problem for, because Atlas has got an enormous amount of confidence and, and he's expressing himself very well. But just in case, I've always been quite careful that we are strong personalities we know what we want, but as parents, there needs to be a lot of room for those kids. Um, and their expressions is going to be as valued about everybody else who walks into his house, especially in the context of most people walks into his house are very confident and, and very expressive. Mm. That's more the way I look at them. Mm. I mean, I'm on board with what you're saying in terms of giving the space to allow them to choose what their personal interests are and also what they've naturally good at. It got me also thinking about this article that was talking about how creative art forms, so not just the visual arts, but music, have kind of been not necessarily dying out, but the idea of it being not being a hobby that you just stay with for the rest of your life, that something that actually enriches you and makes you happy and joyful that it doesn't have to be a career it doesn't mean that you know if you decide to go into the corporate world that all of a sudden you're like okay well this is not for me but having that as part of your life is exceptionally enriching and actually a lot of people are missing out by not having that in their lives and I feel like from my own personal journey that's exactly what happened because I was like okay I'll just do this as a as a hobby. And then I just never did because I never found time for it. But I do absolutely miss that. And just being able, as you said, to express yourself and find a format, a way to get your ideas and thoughts out that are not words, because it's another language, like the visual, the music, it's another form of, it's another language. It's another way to communicate. Um, So I find that fascinating. There's a great book um, that just came out um, by one of my friends, Ada Reed, who's the MD of Commoners, and he just published The Muscle of Imagination. And we just sat next to each other at dinner. We actually about to see each other for lunch again because I feel the two of us sat and I was like, oh my God, you just are literally capturing everything I believe in into one book. And then I read the book and I was so happy. I sent him a long bullet point email of all the things I loved (laughs) about the book. But it just, I'm a big believer in the space of imagination again. So it's about creating space to... The fact that hobbies are dying, I think, is problematic. You should have hobbies that are beyond your job. Like, I have random hobbies from cycling to baking to, like, you know, I'm a very, I love dressing up a table all this Vegas that are not related to my job. And I feel that's a space for imagination, a space for creativity. And I think the happiest moments that I have while watching my kids is when they have that imagination space, you know, when they speak to themselves and they come up with those stories and they are so occupied in it, so busy in their own imagination. 
and the muscle imagination speaks about the need of it and the fact that we had we have all those tools that are trying to take away this precious moments for our imagination our creativity and there's obviously all these apps that are trying to battle for our attention it's literally our our attention is worth billion by now but i think that attention in making sure that we live it also to imagination and creativity and however we do it whether it's baking or walking that we get that bits of imagination but that is so key because that reflection is enabling us first of all to feel happy and mental health supposed to be much better but also to be so much more creative so it's um if atlas is busy imagining something i would never stop it even if there's a even if it technically should be eating at that point i would always move slightly and be flexible because i think that space is so precious in a time where every single technological tool is going to battle for his time and his eyes will i want him to just i want him to have that space so i just would never impose a routine if he's in that space obviously mm. you know he still has to sleep and eat and do all these things but it just i feel like it's that's going to be a big battle again for ge- that generation of kids where everything is done to grab their attention but the doing nothing being bored coming up with ideas is so essential to us being creative beings and being happy as on the back of that that i want to protect it as much as i can and that's the reason i'm not a hardcore routine person when mm-hmm. i see he's in that space it's so true it's having that quiet reflection time to yourself i mean some people meditate some people read books but just having somewhere some you know a moment of time that you dedicate to a hobby that doesn't require too much thinking it's just being present and maybe being busy but not so busy that it requires for you to achieve or attain a goal you're just sort of in the moment in the present and i think we spend so much time in front of screens and being bombarded with things that we don't actually focus on ourselves and things coming from the inside out as opposed to just absorbing things from the outside in yeah, and the achievement in a sense um, we are best demonstration as parents of people who never think of achievements but have achieved a lot in a sense that like this is the reason why i was so scared of the school system in the uk because every school i walked into was telling me they record breaking numbers to get into cambridge and oxford at when my kid was 3 and i was just like i just find that so scary because i don't care what achievement at last does but i really do care that as a human being he's developing happily and confidently and it's um I really don't believe in that relationship with achievements or objective. I think it's um something that makes us miserable to attain to objective and hang on to the idea that might make us happy rather than enjoying the process and doing something that we love. And then of course there's seven new milestones that will come with it, mm-hmm. but it just it, the relationship to achievements I mean I just really don't believe in. Mm-hmm. I just don't think it's healthy. I don't either. I totally totally 100% support <laughs> you on that. Going back to deep fakes AI. Yes. <laughs> and I mean the speed at which technology is moving. Do you think the do you think AI is destroying creatives and creativity? So I have tons of artists who use AI and I actually have a very special story by our artist Ellie Pritz who sadly has a health condition that means she cannot paint anymore so she used AI to further her vision and it is really Ellie's. You couldn't come up with it because the the way she dictates a brief and if you think of Damien Hirst that never really made his work it was always two years of making the works the way she's kind of directing the vision is very artistic so i'm not i'm never scared on how creatives can take on new tools because they are always a way able to expand the creativity of it i think the point with ai as we know is maybe you've seen that court case in the the last few weeks where a lawyer in the states um ask ChatGPT to write the case but they didn't check um and you know the ChatGPT or the the argument look incredibly immaculately put together you will swear that it's supposed to allege it the cases were invented of reference um because probably in the brief they hadn't said it must be actual cases that had happened right that is very scary because the way it's formatted it looks like a true information deep fakes and ai pose the same problems with images where they will more and more be images and you see it even with protests where you can already invent a story like right now there's lots of protests in france you can make it look much more dramatic than it is you can zoom in with the bin that just really exploded with fire and make it sound like the entire france on fire which is going to 
have a ripoff that's disastrous because people are going to think the conflict is much deeper when it really isn't. Um, of course, it's terrible what's happening, but the protests are actually quite small in comparison to the scale that is taking on TikTok and on social media. Deepfake is one layer further than that where you're inventing a story, you're inventing the reality. Now, there's nothing wrong with inventing realities. We've always done it. We go to movies we love and we read fiction books because we love we love a new reality to make us reflect on our own. However, when you do know it's fiction, that's a problem. So, you know, the fact that Harry Potter sold so many books is because it was the biggest escape of all time for those kids. And they were able to relate in their own realities with that book in hand. But not knowing it's fiction, again, is dangerous because, the you know, here in this book, magic doesn't happen mm -hmm. in reality. I think the problem, again, is like you need a toolkit to know those images are fake. But I have no issue with fiction. I'm comfortable being in and out of a fiction and non-fiction world. I'm just not comfortable in having blurred limits that are not defined when no one is informed this would be the case. And I will be thinking, you know, you have done X. And I think also deepfakes were invented by the porn sector. And there's a reason for that is that you could invent sexuality for someone that you could just, you could destroy so many lives in the process of it. And we know how how amazing it is through social media that we can reach many people, but also how soul destroying it is at times that you can have people inventing a reality against you. Deepfake is a furthering of this. And the fact that the porn sector was a creator of it is not reassuring because the, it shows how it could be used against people uh, to create things that have never existed. I didn't know that. That the porn sector created it. Yes. I actually talk about it in my book, so I, I can't even, I had to go down to <laughs> deep research of how visuals were created. So my brain is full of random anecdotes and studies um, thanks to having writing it. I didn't know that before I discovered it either, but I think it makes a lot of sense because obviously the initial first scandals um, were very much people pasting a face onto acts and, and that's, and, you know, like sex and scandals go hand in hand. People love a sex scandal. So actually the porn industry is very innovative as a sector, <laughs> believe it or not. And which makes sense because it's a very large sector. It's one tenth of the internet in terms of content, which is huge. So you can imagine that they have innovated substantially, but they have created defect as a result. Wow. That's interesting how so much of our, you know, it's, a lot of things spilling over from the porn culture that we're not even aware of no. and how it infiltrates sort of the rest of the yes. normal kind of world and society. What surprised you most about the art world? I was too young to have a conception and I never came from it. Um, the thing I would want to change is definitely a stronger meritocracy, a stronger talent diversity, a stronger access to it. Um, and I would love the artists to be the spokespeople of our generation more than the silos um, that tells a few stories to a few people. But actually, how amazing would it be that artists are very central to society and end up being the spokespeople to our generation in that sense. Mm. Thank you so much for coming onto the show, Maureen. It's like so fascinating talking to you and I have so many questions for you. So I think we should do a part two <laughs> yes. for when your book is published, which is coming out next year yeah. in March. Yeah. And I'm very excited for that. But thank um, you so much. Fascinating chat. And thank you so much. My total pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your great questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What were your takeaways? And if you haven't already, I'd love for you to subscribe and follow this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.